Good morning, everyone. It looks like everybody's squeezing in, Tim, real good. So he told me I got to tell everybody squeeze in and like each other because we're going to have a pretty full crowd. So, well, welcome to East Side, and thank you all for coming worship with this morning. Let's begin our morning service in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.
Good morning and a special welcome to each and every one of you, all the visitors. It's good to see you, everybody online. Thank you for watching. And I just want to wish everybody a happy Easter. Announcements and events for this week. Tonight at 6.30, we will have music night. Monday, 7 p.m., men bas basketball. Tuesday, 9.30 a.m., women's Bible study. 7 p.m., we will have volleyball. And 7 p.m. also is teen youth group. Wednesday, 7 p.m., youth group is starting back up. That's for all the ages, and 8.30 pickleball. Next Sunday, 9.30 Sunday school, 10.30 morning worship. Today after the service is, as Dan calls it, our turn left day, so there's a meal. Everyone is welcome, and would be an additional song after table grace so we can allow the elders and all the guests to go first. Update for Eastside's missions, May 19th at 4 p.m. We'll be doing a singing at Ashland Village. June 5th and 7th through the 7th at nine to, from 9 to noon is VBS at Eastside. Online registration will be opening on April 24th. Weekly cleanings for this week, the sanctuary, narthex, and classroom is Lars and Jessica Seppola. Kitchen, gym, and bathrooms is Gunnar and Johanna Matson. Looking ahead for this month, April 8th at 7 p.m., we will have our 2026 convention planning meeting here at the church. April 13th at 8 a.m. is our spring cleaning, so everyone please come help out. April 20th, 9 a.m., we'll be doing Kids Against Hunger food packing, so bring your children. It's a fun event. If you've never been, just come and join us. And April 26th, there'll be the Father, and the, through the 27th, there'll be the Father-Son Camp Out. All are welcome, and there'll be more details to come. Pastor Dan's office hours this week are Tuesday and Thursday from 9.30 to 11.30. And we'll begin with our first scripture reading. Good morning again. First scripture reading today is found in the Gospel of John, verse, chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. We'll read these words again in the name of our Lord. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not, do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which, been, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? 
She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced these, this to the disciples. I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. I'd like to just add a quick note, if I could, before we sing the worship hymn. In the Jewish tradition, when the master left the table, and he was just uh, done, he would take his napkin and just throw it on the table and just be left in a crump, crumple just on the table. But if he was returning, the master would carefully fold his, his napkin and lean it on the place that it was. So isn't it wonderful that Christ, when he arose, he took that head cloth and carefully folded it to prove to all of us he will return very soon. It's wonderful. So let's just uh, carry on with the worship hymn. If you can stand, please do.
second scripture reading this morning is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. We'll read these verses again in the name of our Lord. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, and in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Amen. Shall we pray? Well, Father God, we come to you with just humble, exciting hearts this morning. As we get to celebrate the greatest celebration that we as Christians get to. the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. We thank you and praise you, God, that you, by the mighty power of the Spirit, saw fit to raise him so that we all have hope that we too will be raised to be with you. We thank you for that. We thank you for everything you've done for us, especially for that gift of giving us faith in Christ. Now, Lord, we just come to you this morning. We're going to bring some petitions up to you, Lord. We have so many people hurting, so many people missing loved ones, so many people mourning with loss of loved ones. We just pray that, God, you would be with all of us. We pray especially for the family of Bruce Nemitello this morning, Lord. Just pour the bomb of Gilead on their, on their hearts and in their minds and let them know that he is waiting in heaven for all of us and for all of the family, along with all our loved ones who've marched into heaven by your, God, by your grace and by your mercy. And God, we just also want to remember all those who are sick, preparing for surgery. I know we want to especially bring up Tracy's father, Larry Kinnanen, who has a brain surgery this Thursday. God, we just ask that you would just, by supernatural power, guide the hands of the surgeon so they go in and do the correct things to give him full healing. We thank you and praise you for everything you've done. Thank you for the wisdom of the doctors, the wisdoms of everyone, and we just ask that you would touch us all, lead us all, and guide us all by your spirit. We thank you again for this day and for being able to celebrate Easter. We pray now for the collection that will be taken we ask that you would just use it to the furtherance of your kingdom to spread the gospel news so many more can come into faith in Christ. Now let us say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
and we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let's continue with the offertory hymn. I wonder, do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's a centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. 
He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. Uh, I wish I could describe him to you. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your hand. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. The Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah! That's my king. That's my king. Dr. Lockridge, he's our king. And so the appropriate question is, do you know him this morning? This is why we are here today. Because all of tes scripture testifies of him. What's going to happen? And I promise you all know this. Today our Savior lives. As he says, you can't outlive him. And you can't live without him. The Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't fall into any fault with him, and the scriptures even say that the witnesses couldn't get their testimonies of Jesus Christ to agree. Herod couldn't handle him. Death, or Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And yes, the grave couldn't hold him. That's our king. The resurrection is most definitely real. And in a day where only 30% of proclaimed Protestants attend a weekly worship service, is he still your king? I want to share with you this morning a portion of scripture from the Old Testament once again prophesying what God will do and what God will perform on Easter Sunday morning. And we find this in the book of Isaiah chapter 25. And I will read the entire chapter, all 12 verses, but mainly I will focus on verses 6 through 10. But once again we read in the name of our resurrected Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. O Lord, thou art my God, I will exalt thee. I will praise thy name, for thou hast done wonderful things. Thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. For thou hast made of a city a heap, of a defense city a ruin, a palace of strangers to be no city, it shall never be built. Therefore shall the strong people glorify thee, the city of the terrible nations shall fear thee. For thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat, when the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. Thou shalt bring down the noise of the strangers as the heat in a dry place even the heat with the shadow of a cloud, the branch of the terrible ones shall be brought low. And in this mountain 
shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wines on the lees, well refined. And he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death in victory. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all eyes. And the rebuke of his people shall he take away from all of the earth. For the Lord has spoken it. And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. For in this mountain shall the hand of the Lord rest, and Moab shall be trodden down under him, even as straw is trodden down for the dunghill. And he shall spread forth his hands in the midst of them, as he that swimmeth spreadeth forth his hands to swim. And he shall bring down their pride together with the spoils of their hands and the fortress of the high fort of thy walls shall he bring low, bring down lay low and bring to the ground, even to the dust. Amen. It is my understanding and I've never been to Israel, but in the conversations with people that have been there, and any research I've done on, online, Jerusalem, if you would, lies on a mountain. It lies in a mountain in the Judean mountains. And in these mountains, it lays on a spur. And this mountain, this mountain group includes the Mount of Olives and Mount of Scopus. And if you would, Israel is approximately 2,490 feet above sea level. And it is also my understanding, and I'm willing to be corrected, that most of the rest of the nation of Israel lies low. And if one is going to go to Jerusalem to worship, they're going to have to climb. They're going to have to go high in order that they might go and offer sacrifices to their God in this day. And so it's fitting, very fitting that Isaiah uses this terminology as he begins to describe what's going to happen in this high mountain. That there will come a day when there will be one who is sent, who will deliver God's people from their sins. And it will take place in Jerusalem, up high. And this is what we find this is what we find as Josh read this passage. The events of this week, what we call Holy Week, this place, this all took in and around the city of Jerusalem on the high ground. The events that we have talked about and celebrated this week, including Thursday evening when we celebrated the betrayal of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and his arrest. And also on Friday, which turns out to be the longest day, where he is tried unjustly. He is sentenced to death unjustly. He's marched to a hill outside the city gates, and as we heard on Friday night by Brother Tyler, he was crucified on a cross that had been prepared for Barabbas, a criminal. And we all understand that when he had given up the ghost, he was taken off of that cross and he was placed in a tomb, a new tomb, one that no man had ever laid in. No human being had ever been there. It was an empty tomb. This is where they placed Jesus. And it's quite interesting we find this morning that tomb is still empty, isn't it? That tomb is still 
empty. Because he is risen. The tomb is empty and now God is satisfied in his son Jesus Christ. And as the prophet Isaiah tells us, he says the veil that covered the face of the old covenant, the curtain that kept mankind from the inner tabernacle where the blood of bulls and goats was offered but once a year. Offered but once a year for the atonement of sin. And this by the high priest only. And if he didn't do it correctly, he died. Isaiah tells us, or he prophesies, if you will, that this veil on this day in this high mountain will be destroyed. And all of God's people now have access at any time and in any place to approach God the Father. For whatever reason we so desire, without fear of death, Because as Isaiah tells us, death has now been swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? Paul writes in 1 Corinthians. The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives to us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't ask us to earn it. He just bestows it upon us. That as a Hebrew writer would write in Hebrews 2, that through death he might destroy him that had power of death, that is, Satan himself. Defeated. Defeated. Because Jesus Christ is alive. Both death and Satan cannot be our enemy anymore. Because if Jesus Christ lives, can you say with me, we live also. And if you're sitting here this morning wondering, is this really true for me? If you're sitting here wondering if you're worthy. If you've come here this morning and you're feeling like the worst of the worst. Well join the crowd. There was one. There was one in the scriptures who records the fact that he himself is not worthy. Not worthy of this great gift. As a matter of fact, he says, he says, you know, if you go to our second reading, which God, Josh read, he says, I've been untimely born. These are the words of the Apostle Paul. I mean, he's the one who's the biggest influence outside of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. And he claims that he's untimely born. What a struggle, huh? What a struggle that he might accept the fact that God has called him. As a matter of fact, he writes, as Jesus Christ was risen and victorious and he had appeared to all the different people that scripture records, last of all, Paul says, as one untimely born, he appeared also to me. And then he claims, for I am the least of the apostles. Unworthy to be called an apostle. Why? Because he was a sinner, a great sinner. He killed Christians. And you can see by his words, he struggled with this thing. I'm not worthy to be called an apostle even, he says. But he says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. If you're in a ministry today, you understand this. This becomes very personal for you. We know who we are. 
We know all the things we hide from you and we hope we will never find out about us. We are not worthy to be called into this place, but God's word still says we are by the, what we are, by the grace of God alone. And so are you. No matter what you come here with this morning, it doesn't matter. However you approach this place, for whatever reason you come, maybe you've come just because it's Easter Sunday morning, and that's what many Christians do. They are Easter Sunday morning people. They're Christmas and Easter. We call them seeing ears. And you've come simply because that's what Christians do. For no other reason. Take heart, my friends. This morning was for you also. Because by the grace of God, you are what you are. And his grace, not only towards Paul, was not in vain. But for me and my brother Dale, for all of us who are gathered here today, this resurrection was not in vain for you. It is not in vain. Because he is risen. And in his resurrection, we also have been turned over from death to life. This is the power of the resurrection which we celebrate this morning. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 6. He says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly, we most certainly shall be united with him in a resurrection like his. And he writes and he continues and he says, we know, we know this, that our old self was crucified with Jesus Christ in order that the body of sin might be brought to absolutely nothing. For one purpose, so that you and I would never be enslaved to sin. For he who has died, and we have in Jesus Christ, has been set free from sin. But he doesn't end there. He says, now, let me tell you something else. If we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Do you know him this morning? We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. And so Paul reminds us, so you, you also must consider yourself. You must consider this. You must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. Praise be to his name. Mr. Nematello, your brother may be gone. He may have closed his eyes to this life, but it's to this life only. He lives because Jesus Christ lives. Our sister Naomi, who's watching this morning from Ocala, Florida, this past week she came, she came face to face with her own mortality. And even if God was to take her, it's only for this life. 
She will always live in the Jesus Christ. She will always have life that extends far beyond what this earth can offer. And for our friend Cliff, who woke up this morning in the hospital down six miles south of here, once again with a heart that just tricks him, he also understands that there's no security here. It's found in the resurrected and victorious Jesus Christ because death has been banished. And if he lives, so do we. I've told you this story in the past, I believe, if I have. Excuse me. But when I was in seminary, we had an old-time preacher. His name was A.B. Anderson, and he came to visit us. And one day in class, he looked at me, and he said, Dan, I want to tell you something. He said, if me and Helvi, and Helvi was his wife, he said, if you ever hear that Helvi and I have, have died, don't you believe it. We've just simply moved to a new address. He is risen, and so we too are risen, have been resurrected. We must now consider ourselves in his resurrection. There is no other alternative. If there is no resurrection, then there's no hope. As we have already read, as we have already sung, we may at one time or another have found ourselves dead in our sins and trespasses. But as Paul tells us in Ephesians 2, now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. And he is victorious. And in this victorious Jesus Christ, we are given the evidence of his resurrection. Our resurrection. Because God has destroyed in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. And he has swallowed up death in victory. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all our faces. And the rebuke of his people shall be taken away from off all the earth. For the Lord hath spoken it. Is he your king this morning? Do you know it? Because according to scripture, we have all been born again by this resurrection. Those of us who believe in this risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the word declares to us that we have been born again. This is what it says in 1 Peter. That he has caused us, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from, in, from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Kept in heaven for you. Who by God's power, consider that. Who by God's power, not ours. Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And he says, in this we rejoice. What a wonderful work. What an absolutely marvelous work that all of us who are gathered here today in all of our inabilities, in all of our failings, in all of our ineptness, God has moved us from death to life in the resurrected Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Isaiah says, he says, and in that, it, and it shall be said that this day, lo, this is our God, this is our King. We have waited for him and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him and we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. 
For in this mountain shall the hand of the Lord rest, and Moab shall be trodden down. In this mountain, in this place, in this person of Jesus Christ, Moab, the enemy, has been trodden down, people. You have to believe this. You have to believe this. The victory is ours, not because of anything we've done, but because of Jesus Christ, who went to the Garden of Gethsemane for you, who suffered on Good Friday, was crucified, died and was buried for you. But also this morning, he's alive. He's victorious and it's also for you. And Dr. Lockridge is absolutely right. He is my king. He is your king. And the Apostle Paul adds to that by saying, it is by the grace of God that this is so. And so as we depart, as we celebrate this Easter day, I want to remind you all again, I know it's Easter. There's lots of family plans, lots of lunch deals, and everything that goes with it, we wish to celebrate. But I will invite you once again, when you get to the end of the hallway, turn left. That together, together we might have a party. Together we might worship and celebrate this day because this day is for us. This day is for you. It's for me. And everything that we can even thank God for is because he is victorious. And that by the grace of an almighty God. Alleluia and amen. Let it be so. Let us pray. Father, only that, if only, this marvelous resurrection that gives us life this marvelous resurrection that gives us an ability to explore, even to, even to deal with the things that go on in our daily life. This resurrection, Lord, we pray that for sure this day you make it alive. But also, Father, that from this moment on, every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. That every Sunday becomes Easter Sunday because it is only because of this day that we can claim the victory that you have given us in your son Jesus Christ. And oh boy, do we proclaim it. And so Father, we thank you. We thank you that way back in time, even before the world was created, you loved us in such a way that you would send your only begotten son. He would pay the price for our sins. And in this you would be gracious to us. And that you would make us all by faith part of this same resurrection so that we can face the things we face in life and we can proudly declare, if he lives, so do we. Thank you, Father, for your grace and your mercy and for your love that encompass us even this morning. And now lift your heads and receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his everlasting peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit we pray. Amen and amen.